Well, those of you who are visiting with us, one of the things you know about Brother Park, if you remember here, is we've got to start with a joke. I don't know. People can't remember my sermons, but they say, but I remember the joke you told. I really, I don't know if I like that or not, but uh, of course, all good jokes start with a guy walks into a bar <laughs> wearing a Dallas Cowboy jersey and carrying a cat with a Dallas Cowboy jersey. You know, the other thing I like, I tell jokes about golf and cats, usually, Uh and he had a little Dallas Cowboy helmet on. The cat did. The cat did. So the guy says, the bartender, can my cat and I come in and watch the football game? He said, uh, my TV at home is broke. Can we come here? And uh, we always watch the game together. So the bartender says, well, normally cats wouldn't be allowed in the bar. But well, it's not very busy here tonight, so you and your cat can sit down at the end of the bar. And as long as he behaves... If there's not any trouble, then uh, if there is, I'll have to ask you to leave. The guy agrees, and his cat start watching the game. Pretty soon, the Cowboys kick a field goal. And the cat hops up on the bar and goes down it, high-fiving all the people that are with him. <laughs> Comes back, high-fiving. And the bartender says, man, that's pretty cool. What did he do when they score a touchdown? He said, I don't know. I've only had him for two years. <laughs> And trust me, that has nothing to do with the sermon whatsoever. <laughs> I don't think. No, it doesn't. But uh, I ask you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to read John chapter 4. I'm going to read 10 verses. But before I read that, I want to remind you of a couple of verses in chapter 20 of the Gospel of John. Because John tells us, this is why I have written this down. Sounds pretty important. Verse 30 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So when we read this really neat story in John chapter 4, Understand, that was John's purpose, by direction of the Holy Spirit, to give us this story. God's Word says, chapter 4, John 4, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto Galilee. And he, must, and he must needs go through Samaria. Isn't that a great statement? Then cometh to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, about twelve noon. And there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your presence today. I pray for this one who uh, has fallen ill. I pray for healing. I pray for our team. Lord, just give them peace and safety and comfort. And Lord, I thank you that you have drawn us here today. That you have spoken to us through your word. You have prepared our hearts through song. Lord, you are truly, truly an amazing God. And Lord, like that last song said, is there anybody here that can testify 
of you bringing us through the fire, of you bringing us through the sorrow, oh my, I think every hand in here went up. Lord, thank you for being that God. Thank you for longing to have a relationship with us. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. What a wonderful story from the pages of Scripture. Amen. Uh, a story that t- each and every one of us can relate to. Relate in a variety of ways. Because you see, it kind of depends where you stand with this Christ on how this story will hit you, how it will speak to you, how it spoke to me. Uh, there's not a lot of characters in the story. Of course, number one, we got Jesus. That's a good place to start every time. <laughs> uh, that's where this story begins is with him having a need to go to Samaria. This woman's story begins with Jesus. Do you realize your story begins with Jesus? Whether you know it or not. She didn't know it. But that's where truly life begins. Second, we have the Samaritan woman at the well. Apparently, life's been hard. She's going through life. Life can get hard pretty quick, can't it? It can change that quick. Everything going smooth. Somebody asked how our family's doing. I said, well, at this moment, we're doing great. But it's subject to change. Uh, Third, we have the disciples. Now, they're not much of the story. Uh, I do find it unusual, though, that Jesus had to get them out of the way. So that he could deal with this woman as well. Finally, we have the women, or at least the townspeople of Sychar. They're kind of on the fringe a little bit, but they come on strong at the end. You see, it depends where you are, though. Are you lost? If you died tonight, would you know, without a doubt, based on your faith in Christ... That you would go to heaven. I sure hope so. I hope you know that. I hope you know that's You know I tell our new members in orientation. That if the day that I stand before holy God. And if he says. Park why should I let you into my heaven. If I say I'm a member of Flint Baptist Church. We're going to hear a. Eh, that's going to be the wrong answer. Hey I'm kind of like brother Sam. Adding those sound effects. I just now noticed that. I've been trying to figure out how to get that into sermons because he'll go pow, boom, zoom, and I don't ever do that. So eh, you probably won't hear a buzzer. I don't know. But the reality is the only way any of us will ever enter into the kingdom of heaven is by the precious blood of Jesus. And he has covered my sin, and, and he is my personal Lord and Savior. That's the only way. But if you're here and you're saved, in other words, you don't know just about Jesus. You know him personally and in an intimate way that he is your Lord and your Savior. We'll we'll see this in a different view. You know, there's different things that cause or bring about or birth a, a sermon in preachers' lives. This is a passage I have not been able to get away from. I I, I preached it in Guatemala through an interpreter. I preached it in another foreign country, Minnesota. (laughs) I'm kidding. I know Minnesota is not a foreign country. If you're from Minnesota, we loved it while we were there. Uh, But I'm wondering how many even those that we would say are saved or you would say you're saved, are arrogant enough to think we don't need a meeting with Jesus. I met him. I, don't, I, I got it covered. Me and the man upstairs. Are, I, I've heard them all. 
But this is a unique story. First, we see the setting. It is crystal clear. He makes it very precise. The location, the time, the events that are happening. You see, he's in uh, uh, Judea, and he's heading to Galilee. Uh, Galilee, a region in northern Israel. Uh, Judah in the southern Israel. In a small little region in the middle called Samaria. A good Jew making this trip would head east, cross the Jordan River, go north, and then come back across the Jordan River just so they wouldn't run into those nasty Samaritans. So what's a Samaritan? you got the Jews. I always found it amazing that in the Old Testament particularly, the nation of Israel, the Jews, everybody knew that they were the people of Jehovah God. They knew it. <laughs> yeah, dudes, ask them, they tell you. But it seemed like everybody else knew it too. Even the Philistines or all the Canaanites, any of them, that, that they knew if Jehovah God showed up for the battle, we're going to lose. But if Jehovah God doesn't show up, we got a chance. And there were a few times Israel went into battle and didn't bring Jehovah God with them. They went on their own, and, and God said, I can't bless that, and they were defeated. So you got the Jews, and then you got the pagans, which is everybody else, and the Samaritans were the half-breeds, part Jews who had married into pagans. Now, the problem with that, God kind of foresaw that when he said, when you take over a land, I want you to wipe out everybody. And everybody says how cruel that is. I got it. But here's the problem. When they came in to intermarry with the Jews, they brought some of their beliefs. They brought their worship. And that's who they are. And the Jews despised them. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews. So that's why a good Jew would cross over the Jordan, go north, and then cross back. But did you hear it? In the NLT, this is the way, verse 3, or maybe 4, he had to go through Samaria on the way. King James said, and he must needs go through Samaria. Every detail, specific, even location, time. And then it says, then he cometh to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the partial ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, being wearied with his journey, how did he get there? He walked a lot of miles. And he thus sat on the well. And it was about the sixth hour, 12 noon. So here's the encounter. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus says to her, give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy me. Make a middle note of that. Then saith the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me? Which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would have given the living water. The encounter. Her mindset. Jews don't have nothing to do with us. Matter of fact, even in Jewish society, men didn't speak to women other than their wives and usually not even in public. So here's the conversation. It's about water. The woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence thou hast living water. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, and gave, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. 
But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water which I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. See, her position and her understanding is we're talking about water. Everybody knows about water. Everybody got to have water. You can't go long without water. What, three days? Uh, no, three, three minutes without air, three days without water. You, you, we, we got it. But she's talking about the physical water. Jesus is talking about spiritual water. Huh. Isn't that like Jesus? Taking a subject that we all know about, a very common subject, a common need that she knows all too well because she comes out here every single day in the heat of the day to draw water for her family, for her and her family. Every single day, all alone, because the other women in the city didn't want her. We're going to learn a little more about her. Didn't want her type to come with them. And then I thought, well, maybe she didn't want to go. Maybe she understood who she was and she didn't want to go with them. Then we have the confrontation. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, Thou hast answered well, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The confrontation, and some people would read that and go, Well, that wasn't very nice. How dare Jesus just, well, let me ask you this. She's thinking physical water, physical needs. I come every day through my stinking life that I've got to come for my family. And Jesus is seeing beyond that and saying, you've got a bigger need than just physical water. You've got a need for something spiritual, spiritual water that literally will flow out of your belly like springs of living water. So it would seem to me It's not just nicer of Jesus. It's out of love. He tells her the truth. You've got a bigger need than just this water. There's something bigger that we need to deal with. You're talking about physical water. I'm talking about spiritual. A spiritual need that you have. So it, it's not unloving to confront. So, verse 19, she says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So he has taken that common and transferred it to the spirit, from the physical to the spiritual. That's always the challenge, isn't it, when you faith, share your faith? It's taking it from the physical to the spiritual. How do I get to the spiritual? While we're discussing bass boats or golf or something else. The conversion happens. The woman says, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh. When shall neither in this mountain nor Jerusalem worship the Father. We worship, ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith to him, I know that the Messiah cometh which is called Christ. And when he has come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith to her, I that speaketh unto thee am he. Verse 
So we went from the physical to the spiritual. And he met her right where she was. She said, we worship here in this mountain. Y'all say, we got to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, there's coming a day that wherever you are, you can worship God in spirit and in truth. Because it's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's not where you are, it's who you are and what you're worshiping. Then we see the testimony. Verse 27. And upon this came his disciples, (laughs) they show back up, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man saith, what seekest thou? Why are you talking to her? Or why talkest thou with her? And the woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And it says, They went out of the city and came to him. Now down in verse 20, 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. And so the Samaritans were coming to him. They besought him that he would tarry with them, and he bode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said to the woman, Now we believe not because of the saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Isn't that a neat story? That is a wonderful story that many of us we can relate to in so many different levels and places. So we're going to spend the rest of my time on the application. Number one, Jesus is willing to work to get to you. Understand something. That is what you would call a divine appointment. You see, some, some, we have come for all different kind of reasons today. Some of you are here because your wife made you come. You wouldn't dare say amen to that. I know. <laughs> some of you are here. I can relate. Back years ago, we've been married 47 years, but 50 years ago, I started coming to church because Dickie didn't date boys who didn't go to church. So if I wanted to date her, I had to go to church. Well, fine, I'll go. Such a sweet spirit about me. There for all the wrong reasons. Every wrong reason in the book. But that's there. And I had a divine appointment with Jesus that I did not even know was coming. Because he made it. He made the divine appointment. Folks, don't think for one second you are here by chance. Don't think for one second it's by chance. I'm preaching John chapter 4 about the Samaritan woman at the well. God had you here for a purpose. And he would walk. He would weary, become weary just to keep a meeting with her. And he will do the same for you. I don't think we're here by chance. We, we might not have known it was coming. But we're here because of a divine appointment. Secondly, Jesus is willing to break down every barrier this world wants to put up between you and him. Every barrier. Whether it's racial, whether it's gender. That's, we see both of those in this. She's a Samaritan. You don't talk to Samaritans. Why do you think they had to get the guys out of the way? The disciples, he couldn't have had this interchange, this encounter with this woman with the disciples there. He had to send them to town to buy meat so that he could talk with this Samaritan woman. Why? Because he was willing to break down a barrier. It didn't matter that Jews didn't deal with Samaritans. He dealt with individuals. He had this divine appointment with a divine uh, a counter, and he was willing to break down every barrier this world wants to put up to keep you from him. No matter how much sin you have in your life, no matter what bad decisions you have made, 
Some of them were brought on. Some of them were brought by others into your life. No matter who has rejected you, no matter who has hurt your feelings, no matter who told you, get out and don't come back, we don't like your kind in our midst. Jesus is willing to break down every barrier that you maybe have put up or that others have put up. I want you to know something. Jesus loves your kind. He loves young men that are here because they're chasing a girl. He died for you. He is the breaker of chains. He is the friend of sinners. He's the great healer. He's the great physician. And he loves you. Third application I don't like. I wonder if sometime we're not like the disciples who Jesus has to get out of the way to be able to reach out and touch a love-starved woman who needed him so that she can hear, so that she can see in action, no matter what the barrier are, I love you. We see the attitude It's not hard in verse 27, 28. Then came his disciples and marveled that he talked to this woman. Why would you talk to this kind of woman? Yet nobody spoke up. And verse 28 says, The woman left her water pot, the very reason she was there, and went her way into the city. Application number four. God will take your life. And your testimonies and all your stories and all your reputation that come along with you. And we'll give you a new life and a new story and a new testimony. I was amazed. She went into the city and talked to the men and said, come see. I have met the Messiah. He told me everything I'd ever done. Well, let's camp out there for a minute. How would you like, if you'd sat down out here, some long-haired guy, I guess he had long hair, came and sat down beside you and began to tell you everything you had ever done. I'd be saying, come on, we we need to step over here because somebody else might hear this. That would, what a confrontation. But it was a confrontation of love. And he said, come see. Come see and gave her a testimony of of, most of the time. The people would have said, I don't care what this woman's got to say. You know what kind of woman she is? Why would we listen to her? And yet they did. Because Jesus had given her a new testimony, a new story, a new life. And it says on down in 39, many of the Samaritans in that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that I ever did. And when the Samaritans were come, they besought him that he would stay with them, tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. From notorious sinner to soul winner. To soul winner. So where are you in the story? Where do you fit? Are you the woman at the well? The Samaritan? Struggling? Life's been hard. Sometimes you brought it on yourself. Sometimes others brought it. But you're hurt. You're rejected. Sometimes you're ready to give up. I know you're ready to find something new. It's not something, it's someone. And his name is Jesus. There is a Savior that loves you. And he made a special trip to this place today to meet with you. Are you like the disciples? 
Oh, you know Jesus. But you're hindering people to come to him. Are you like the original townspeople? You have made your judgment on someone and nothing they can do or say will ever change your opinion. I can remember hearing someone say that a leopard doesn't change its spots. A leopard might not, but Jesus can change your spots. Instead of being a friend to someone who needs help desperately. Are you like the town people later in the story? Someone told you, I have met the Messiah. Come and see. The one we've been waiting on is here. What you've been looking for. The one you've been looking for is here. And you can meet him today. In this place. I pray that we at Flint, and I I don't think we are. With all my heart, I don't think we do. But I pray we are never a hindrance. But always have open arms, welcoming a hospital for the hurting. And the question is, do you want to be a part of a church like that? Then you come.